uh, This Is Us is a series that's all about Christian family. You don't have to look very far into the scripture and you'll discover two things about the Christian family. One, it's intended to look and function differently than anything you see out there that's called a family in the world, including those among other world religions. Christian family is just different. Secondly, when we talk about the Christian church family, that designation goes beyond what we might traditionally call the nuclear family or the biological family. The Christian family also includes the church, what we might call you know, God's family. And within the church family, there are a variety of of family makeups, if you will. We have right here in this room couples who have children. We have couples who don't have children. We have grandparents who are raising or helping to raise grandchildren. We have couples who have adopted children, who foster children. And in our church, it just seems like throughout uh, the span of a year, we typically have at least half a dozen or so couples who are engaged to be married. So we'll just sort of put them in the category of, um, you know, two B families. And as I think about it, I mean that pretty much that pretty much encapsulates the whole family, right? I didn't leave anybody out, did I? And some of you are saying, "Yeah, you left me out." I didn't mention singles, did I? And now that was intentional for the purposes of the message. But you see, the point is that we often, especially as married couples, we forget the singles. When I was going down that list and then just the word singles came out of my, mind, out of my mouth, some of you thought, oh yeah, I forgot about them too. You see, that's the point, exactly. We tend to forget about them. And what we need to understand this morning is when I refer to the church and the church family and we talk about this series, This Is Us, let's not forget that the us includes them. And so today's message, I'm going to try to drive that point home that singles, you need to know as a part of New Life Church, you are not forgotten. Even though at times it may seem or feel like it, you're not forgotten, you're not left out, you're not overlooked. You might feel alone, but as the title of today's message states, you might be single, but you're not solo. We are your church family, and we're here for you. And so, I want to drive that point home this morning by making a few statements to both the singles in the room, and then at the end, those of us who are married to the couples. Again, whether you're married or an unmarried couple about to be or planning to get, to get married. Uh, but I want to speak to the singles first, and I want to dedicate the, most, uh, the bulk of the time in this message to them with this understanding. They are the ones, typically who have to endure messages and even entire series on marriage and relationships. The whole time may be wondering, what's this got to do with me? You know, I'm not married. How do I apply, apply these truths, these, these principles? And so that's why I want to speak to you first. Uh, but with that in mind, given that the majority of people in here are couples and, and most married, don't tune me out, okay? What I'm saying to the singles is important for you to hear as well. It may not be personally applicable to you, but you might know someone, a family member, a friend, or a co-worker who is single with whom you might be able to share these things with and in some way encourage them as well. So, to the singles, let me make several scriptural statements. These are biblical statements that I believe 
will support you, will encourage you, and also challenge you. Number one, the number one statement to singles, though you might object to this upon first hearing it, singleness, singleness, believe it or not, is a gift. Singleness is a gift. I read an article recently, and the writer made this statement about singleness. Quote, Singleness can feel like the participation trophy in the game of life. He also added that singleness is often viewed as the gift that nobody asks for. Nobody wants. Now, understanding that he would go on in the article to point out that that assessment about singleness, not only is it not accurate, but it's not biblical. And he also stated that the Bible teaches us that, in fact, singleness is a gift from God. Now, I want you to see that for yourself. So, if you would, everybody turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. We're going to be reading several passages from uh, this chapter. But while you find your way there, Paul begins this particular chapter speaking directly to husbands and wives on the matter of mutual marital duties that each has to their spouse. In, in specific, he's talking about um, sexual duties or responsibilities. But he very quickly turns his attention to address those who are unmarried. Down around verse 6, he makes this disclaimer as he's making the transition And the disclaimer is, in verse 6, this is a concession, not a commandment. So what Paul is saying is, what I'm about to say to you is my opinion based upon my personal experience. It is not a directive from the Lord as to the way things have to be. Okay, And so here is the concession. In, in chapter 7, verse 7, Paul says, I wish that all of you were as I am. And now we determine from verse seven or verse 8, then we'll read in a minute, that he is single. He is unmarried. I wish that all of you were as I am, but each of you has your own gift. From who? God. One has this gift, another has that. So it's quite apparent. That Paul is speaking to both married and unmarried individuals when he says one has this gift and another has that. He's simply pointing out that these two relational statuses are very different lives and lifestyles. They're different relationship statuses, but both married and unmarried should be viewed as a gift from God. Now, let me remind you something about what the Bible states about gifts from God. James chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, James writes this. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights. In other words, the one who created the sun, moon, and stars, the universe, God himself, who does not change like shifting shadows. Let me summarize what James just said there. If it's a gift from God, it's a good one. It's a good gift. And Paul has stated that that singleness, just like marriage, is a gift from God. And I want you to hear that very clearly this morning. If you are here single today, whether you've ever been married before or not, you find yourself single again, it doesn't really matter the reasoning, don't deceive yourself, James said. Don't deceive yourself. Don't believe the lie that your singleness, and I'm going to explain this a little later on, your singleness, whether it's temporary or not, don't believe that your singleness is anything but a gift from God. You might think, well, yeah, but last week when you talked about marriage, You pointed out in Genesis chapter 2, you know, verse 18, 
God saw that man was alone, and he said, that's not good. It's not good for man to be alone, so I will make a helper suitable for him. Well, let's make one distinction. Alone and single are not the same thing. You can be single and not be alone. Hence, Christian community, the church family. But we can point to plenty of scriptures, whether in the teachings of Jesus or right here in the letters of Paul, where Paul himself, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says, it is good if it's possible for you to do so. And we'll read some of that here in just a moment. It's good if it's possible for you to do so, to remain single. So the thing to remember, at least for now, is to embrace your current state as a gift. Yeah, but pastor, that's easy for you to say. You're married. Right? I can understand the reluctancy, the hesitancy to to see singleness as a gift, to embrace it as something good. Especially if you're someone who is single but desires to be married. But Don't tune me out here. These are biblical statements. Just stick with me. And and you'll definitely see where we're going here. Let me make another statement about singleness. Not only does the Bible teach us that it's a gift, it's a good thing. But number two, Scripture tells us that singleness has its advantages. Has its advantages. We live in a world full of distractions. And a few of the advantages that I see of being single can be summed up this way. The person who is single has the ability, the opportunity to devote greater focus in three primary areas of his or her life. Let me give those to you right quick. Number one, in the area of communion with God. Communion with God. Number two, In the area of community with others. And number three, in the area of a commitment to ministry, to serving God and serving the church. Now let me show you that in Scripture. Later on in chapter 7 of 1 Corinthians, Paul has been, since we last left him there in the first uh, couple verses we read there in in verse 7, he's been talking about and highlighting some of the concerns legitimate concerns, some of the challenges that married individuals have to give attention to, that they have to face, that typically singles do not have to worry so much about, which maybe, again, that's another advantage. There's some challenges. There's some difficulty that comes along with being married that, that singles don't necessarily have to, uh, to face. But anyway, verse 32, picking up here, he says, I would like you... To be free from concern. This is his case for remaining single. An unmarried man is concerned about the Lord's affairs. How he can please the Lord. But a married man is concerned about the affairs of the world. How he can please his wife. His interests are divided. An unmarried woman or a virgin is uh, concerned about the Lord's affairs. Her aim is to be devoted to the Lord in both body and and spirit. But a married woman is concerned about the affairs of this world, how she can please her husband. I'm saying this for your own good, not to restrict you, but that you may live in a right way in undivided devotion to the Lord. Did you pick up on the repeated use of certain words there like affairs? Not talking about the infidelity kind. But affairs, concerns, devotion, or being devoted to. Paul is highlighting here that that typically those who are single have the distinct advantage when it comes to the amount of time, the amount of energy, focus that they can give, number one, to his or her relationship with the Lord. As specifically stated there in verse 35, when he said, undivided devotion to the Lord. 
that kind of energy and, and ability to focus attention and time, I think also translates over into not just a person's relationship with the Lord, but the work of the ministry, serving, doing kingdom-oriented things, helping out in the church. Because when you're dealing with a family, you're married or you have kids, that kind of thing, meeting the needs of your family, and especially that of a spouse, is a huge responsibility. And it is a vital Christian duty, according to Scripture. And what that means is, those who are married, while they may like to spend time and attention and greater energy on these other things, it's not always available. Because there are other things in their life that have to take precedent. Now, singles, don't hear what I'm not saying. I am not saying here that you aren't busy and that you just sit around and you got all this free time that you're apparently wasting. That is not it at all. I understand that single people are busy too, especially if you're a single parent. I can't even imagine. The, I'm just speaking in general terms here. Taking in the wide, broad spectrum of singles represented in our church. And, and so, just so you understand, we're talking here from middle schoolers to single retirees. That's, that's a pretty broad spectrum. And across that spectrum, in general, single people, though it may not be always the case, will typically have more freedom, more flexibility, more time to do some of these other things we've been talking about than those who are married. So there are some advantages. However, number three, like Paul, this is my concession. This is my concession about singleness. Number three, singleness is difficult. It's difficult. It's a gift from God, no doubt. It certainly has some distinct advantages. But I expect an amen here from the singles. It ain't easy. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it's not an easy life. There are challenges that come along with being single that, again, couples, married individuals know nothing about, don't have to deal with. And, and I think that's one of the reasons why in Genesis we read what God said there. That it's not good for Adam to be alone, for man to be alone. And so he created Eve as a helper suitable for him. And that, that road goes both ways. Eve was created to come alongside Adam and help him. But Adam was also responsible for helping her. Like we talked about last week. It's as if they, they completed or complemented one another. They compensated for each other's weaknesses and so on and so forth. And there were certain needs that are sort of baked in that... That marriage is like the primary context in which God meets those needs. That deep longing for companionship. Certainly the need or the desire for sexual intimacy is met there in the context of the marriage relationship. And though the New Testament speaks of singleness as a very positive thing, it's obvious that, that some of these needs... That again, are sort of baked into our existence. Create some level of difficulty for someone who's single. So what does that mean? Well, that means for you, you are likely at times going to struggle. Let's just use those two examples I gave. There are times when you're likely to struggle more so than a married couple with uh, feelings of loneliness and perhaps temptation towards sexual sin. And so your, your boundaries, your guardrails, are going to have to be up a little, a little higher, and, and you're going to have to take a greater, put forth a greater effort to guard against these things. And there might be some adult singles right now here saying, Pastor, are you telling me that as an adult single, 
that scripture does not give me permission to have sex? Let me see if I can make this uh, concise and clear. Yes. <laughs> it is exactly what I'm saying. And it's not my opinion. It is God's word. Okay? And it's, but it's true for all of us. When Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18, flee sexual immorality. He didn't just say singles. He didn't simply say teenagers or married couples flee. No, all of us have a responsibility to guard sexual purity. It's interesting there that the word immorality that Paul used is the Greek word pornea. That's where we get the word porn, pornography. And so I would say this, married or unmarried, the Bible teaches us that we should avoid sexual sin at all costs. But there are no exceptions. Since I'm speaking to singles, there are no exceptions for singles that would allow for casual sex, self-pleasure, or virtual fulfillment. These are, are understandably natural, God-given desires, which again is one of the reasons I am conceding that singleness can be difficult. And it is imperative that you seek to satisfy God-given needs and desires in healthy, non-sexual, godly relationships. That's my challenge to you, singles. And you can find those in the church. But these are some scriptural statements. Some, I think, may be easier to embrace than others. Singleness is a gift. It does have its advantages, but there's also a level of difficulty that comes along with it. Number four, I think the Bible teaches us that singleness can be seasonal, while celibacy, celibacy is a calling. Two different things. Both are uh, a way of describing someone who are, who's single, but they're different. Look back with me at the text here, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 8 and 9. Paul here says, Now to the unmarried and to the widows, I say, it's good. There it is again. It's good for them to stay unmarried, as I do. So Paul just admitted he's a single. As I do. But if they cannot control themselves, they should marry, for it's better to marry than to burn with passion. He would go on to say later in the chapter, verse 36, If anyone is worried that he might not be acting honorably toward the virgin he is engaged to, and if his passions are too strong and he feels he ought to marry, he should do as he wants. He's not sinning. They should get married. It's, it, it's not wrong. right? But, verse 37, But the man who has settled the matter in his own mind who's under no compulsion, has control of his own will, and has made up his mind not to marry the virgin, this man also does the right thing. So then he who marries the virgin does right, he who does not marry her does better, in Paul's eyes, remaining as a single. Now, I can just sort of summarize all of that, make it a little easier to, um, to digest what Paul is trying to get us to see here is that marriage, while there's an argument to be made that it is for most, it's not for all. But on the other hand, singleness, it may be for some, but even then, it may not be for a lifetime. So in other words, it's seasonal. It's, it, it's temporary. I think the Bible teaches us that, that marriage is God's will for most individuals, which includes those of you who are currently single for whatever the reason. It is likely that you will seek to and end up getting married. So in other words, it's temporary. And for some of you, that probably comes as a relief. Man, this is just a season. This too shall pass. But that's not always the case. Uh, Pew Research did a study a few years ago 
And out of those they polled, 69% of the respondents said they were either married or in a committed romantic relationship. Of the 31% left, they identified as being single. Unmarried, they, you know, they weren't dating anybody, uh, they weren't in any kind of committed relationship. And what's interesting about this study is that of that 31%, it was split down the middle, pretty much, 15 and 15. 15% of them said, I'm not interested in marriage, I'm not interested in a serious relationship, in any kind of romantic relationship with anybody, I'm just fine the way things are. And then the other 15%, it, it said, hey, I want to get married. If that's a possibility. I'm open to it. I desire to be married. But when you combine all of that data, what you come up with is 69% who are, are committed or are married and 15% of those who are single but yet desire to be married, you have 84%. So the vast majority of people who either are or would like to be or one day will be married which again teaches us that for most for most marriage is God's will but for some it will be singleness at least at least temporarily however then you have that whole other category of those who will choose to remain single for a lifetime right and when I, when I refer to somebody who's single for a lifetime, or, or you hear the word celibacy, let's not limit that. I don't know if you look that term up in the definition. It has a, a sort of like a sexual orientation to it. I'm not talking, in celibacy, I'm not limiting it to just, you know, a life of sexlessness. No, a committed life of singleness for a lifetime, which what we're going to see here in Scripture is usually the result of a personal and clear calling from God. Let me show that to you. In his discussion here in chapter 7, as we've already seen, Paul makes several appeals to those who are unmarried to, if possible, stay that way. In the middle of all this, he, to me, it seems like he goes down this rabbit trail and he starts talking about uh, those who are uh, circumcised and uncircumcised, those who were slaved and freed and so on and so forth, and it's back and forth. But there's this theme that is consistent. The theme is his repeated use of the word called. There is a state in which someone is called. And he says, in whatever state you are called, I would urge you to remain in that state. And this is where he gets back to his argument for singleness. Verse 17. Nevertheless, each person should live as a believer in whatever situation the Lord, get this, has assigned to them, just as God has called them. And he says, I laid down this rule in all of the churches. He's consistent in this teaching. If we pair what Paul is saying here with what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 19, it becomes clear to us that a lifetime of singleness, while it may not be and likely will not be for all, it will be for some. And for those, it will be a calling. It will be an assignment from the Lord. In Matthew chapter 19, Jesus is in a discussion about uh, divorce, about adultery, and his disciples, after a few comments about those things, his disciples come to the conclusion and state, well, in that case, Lord, it would be better if someone just never married, if they stayed single for a lifetime. To which he replied in verse 11, not everyone can accept this word. In other words, what you're saying is right, but not everybody's up for the task. Not everyone can accept this word, but only to those to whom it's been given. You see that sense of calling, a singling out and assigning. He says in verse 12, there are eunuchs, and I know some of you are thinking, what's that? 
what's that word? Uh, let's just generally define it and understand it as someone who is single due to a variety of possible reasons. But in essence, a single. There are those who are born that way. In other words, it, 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 was, it was meant to be from, from the time of the beginning of their life. There are those who have been made that way by others. And there are those who choose to live like eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom. And he adds, the one who can accept this should accept it. Again, Jesus is confirming what we've already discussed, is that while singleness in general should be viewed as a gift from God, celibacy, a lifetime of that, is a calling. And it tends to be somewhat of a rare an exceptional gift. And only a few, he says, can accept that. But of the few who can, they should. You might think, well, why? Well, for some of the reasons we've already talked about. Some of those advantages. Some of the opportunities that it affords to immerse oneself into the kingdom of God and devotion to the Lord but I would also say, give you this word of caution. If you're single and you're not sure if your singleness is seasonal or if it should be permanent, listen, if you're not absolutely convinced that it's a call from the Lord to be permanent, don't try it. <laughs> because you're only going to make life more difficult and frustrating for yourself. Continue to seek the Lord's will and follow him wherever he leads now for the couples I understand I've, speak, I've spoken to the singles for the most of the time here this morning and that was certainly intentional and so couples I said at the beginning like don't get lost in this and tune me out so I hope you haven't done that but if you have wake up it's your turn okay let me give a few words of caution to all of the married couples in the room. All of those couples in the room who you're looking toward getting married. Maybe you're in a serious dating relationship or you're engaged and, and things seem to be heading that way. Here are some words of caution to the couples. Number one, don't idolize marriage. Don't idolize marriage. Listen, I love being married. I love marriage in general. I, I, would, I could not really imagine life without my wife. After 20 years now, I, I don't want to imagine doing life without her with me. But here's the thing. While I believe that marriage was instituted in the beginning and blessed by God, and while I... I believe, and can point you to Scripture, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 4, or chapter 13, verse 4. Marriage, it says, should be honored by all. All. Honored by all. It should never be idolized. Because while marriage is good, it's not God. It's not God. It, it is not life's highest calling. Marriage is not life's greatest goal. It is not life's ultimate achievement. You want to know what life's highest and greatest goal is? What the greatest achievement in life is? Read Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13. Read Psalm chapter 145. I'll summarize it for you. Man's greatest goal, man's highest calling, is to glorify God and enjoy Him. Period. To glorify God and enjoy Him. So let's be careful and not idolize marriage. Number two, never make a single feel second class. Again, I am for marriage. And I believe marriage is for most. But just because I'm married or because you're married, it doesn't make us better. It doesn't make us spiritually superior either. Which is interesting because it seems to be one of the issues that Paul was addressing in the Corinthian church was this view 
that spiritual gifts made certain people spiritually superior than others. And he goes through this long discussion about spiritual gifts in 1 Corinthians 12 through 14. And he directly and forcefully denounces that theory. That no level or particular spiritual gifts makes any one person better or closer to God than the next. But here's the interesting part. In his comments on both spiritual gifts and on marriage, which we've already, or on marriage and singleness, which we've already identified both are gifts, he uses the same word. The same word for spiritual gifts, charisma, is the same word he uses for marriage and for singleness. Charismas, gifts from God. And so that makes me think that perhaps there were those in the, in the Corinthian church who were attempting to assign to marriage a sense of spiritual superiority. That being married made you better. Being married made you closer to God. Well, I think it's apparent that our spirituality the mark of maturity has nothing to do with relationship status, marital status. Listen, if, if being married meant that I were closer to God than you as a single, you know who missed the mark? Jesus. So it can't be. So let's not make them feel that way. Number three. Couples, remember to include singles. And here's the reason why. Because your spiritual family is the whole church. Your spiritual family is the whole church. Nobody likes to feel left out. Nobody wants to be the one sort of sitting on the sidelines watching everybody else. Being made to feel inferior or less important or unneeded. Paul describes in 1 Corinthians 12 that the church is the body of Christ. And the only way that the body of Christ can function optimally is if every part of the body is doing and performing its intended function. But then you also see that the Bible says not only is the church a body, but it's a family. And in the family, there are different roles. And it, and it takes all of us to make the family work as it should. It's the very same principle. And couples, that includes the singles. They are a part of the body. They are a part of the family. They have a, a vitally important role to play and functions to carry out to make our church family work. And so it's our responsibility to do whatever's necessary to make them feel a part of the family, to include them, to help them avoid some of these temptations, to overcome some of these difficulties and frustrations. You might say, well, how, could I, how can I do that? How can I serve as a married couple? How can we serve a single in our church? It could be as simple as opening your home to them as regularly and as willingly as you would another married couple. Invite them over for dinner. You know, just include them as, as a part of your, your group, if you will. Speaking of groups, if you're a life group leader, seek out the singles. Invite them in to your group. Yeah, but we're a group made of married couples. Maybe that's a problem. Maybe you're missing out on some perspective. Seek out the singles. Invite them. And when you're sharing God's word and relating it to life, make sure that you're taking the extra step to make that truth understandable and relatable to their particular situation. Don't always just speak to the couples. Ministry leaders, when you're seeking out and recruiting volunteers, look for the singles. Don't just immediately go to the couples that you know in church and say, hey, why don't you jump on board over here with this ministry or that ministry. While that may be good and they may be a good fit, you might also be missing out. Because again, it might be a single person 
that you find can devote more time, more focused effort or, or energy, be more flexible or available than a couple. They may turn out to be even a better fit than the person who's married. So don't forget them. And finally, I make this statement to all of us. Whether married, seasonally single, or you're one of those few who have chosen that this is my calling and I'm committed to it for a lifetime. I want to reinforce that this is us. That's New Life Church. That's who we are. And the us would not be complete without the S. You, the single. And so no matter your relationship status, fix your eyes on Jesus. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Because in the end, though marriage is important, Though it matters, it's not something that's going to last forever. But that relationship that we have with Christ, that'll last forever. Which means that's what matters most. And that relationship, married or single, must always come first. So let's all stand together. As we did last week, let's end with a time of prayer. Firstly, for and over our singles and then secondly we'll pray for and over married couples as it pertains to those in our church family who are single so pray with me now with and for our singles God we come before you today recognizing that in our church family there is a broad spectrum of relationship statuses Certainly the majority are married couples. But there, there's also a segment of our church. Whether we're talking about, you know, the middle schooler, high schooler, college age individual, or a retired widow. There's a, there's a broad range of those in our church family who are single. Some seasonally some who have who have committed themselves to a lifetime of singleness Lord we lift them up to you recognizing acknowledging but also honoring them this morning as a part of our church family embracing them as as a part of who we are and recognizing that that our church would not be the same and it would be worse off without them. They are so vitally important to the purpose, the mission that you have given us here at New Life Church. To give people who are far from God the opportunity to experience new life in Christ. There are those and there are ways in which singles can carry out that vision that married couples cannot. And so, Lord, we pray for them. We pray over them today. May your hand of blessing and favor be upon their lives. We acknowledge the difficulty that at times comes from being single. And, Lord, we pray that you would strengthen them and empower them to push through the difficulty. Lord, to, at all cost protect themselves against loneliness against isolation against feelings of insufficiency and Lord help them to protect their sexual purity and in all ways and in all areas of their life honor you Lord bless them today for our married couples here Lord we pray in the context of those who are single that we would be the role models that those who are single but looking to be married need that we would be the pattern of marriage that sort of
clears the way, lays out the path for a healthy marriage that they can follow. That we would mentor them, come alongside them to encourage them. Whether seasonally single or not, God, I pray that our married couples today would develop a heart for our singles. To love on them, to encourage them, to include them, to recognize them as the important part of the family that they are. And together, Lord, maybe we rally around this idea that this is us. This is who we are. The Christ-centered church family. And in the end, may you receive the glory, the honor, and majesty forever. Amen. We'll see you next week.